I'm, uh, I'm Greg Tatum, and um, I may be talking about WebGL, and I'm trying to make my slides, I try to make them kind of small and kind of, so I don't flip through a whole bunch. So, um, kind of start out, it's like, why, why am I here? Like, why am I talking to you? Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to start out with. So kind of for me, I have a background in um, my degrees in contemporary sculpture, which is kind of a bizarre thing to kind of go from sculpture to programming. But I kind of hear like a lot of web devs kind of come from like weird backgrounds as well. Um, so I guess that's not that crazy. Uh, so for me, going up, you know, growing up and learning like how to do like all the art stuff and sculpture, um, doing visual stuff is really exciting for me. Um, and so I, I do a lot of um, what I call programming poetry. So the idea of a, of a poem in code is a poem is a small piece of like aesthetic content that is kind of satisfying to look at, understand, it has a theme, and it's quickly kind of, you get it, it's a package. Um, so I like that idea, and that's kind of what a lot of my personal work, and I'll, I'll show some of that later. Um, currently, I'm the um, senior dev at a company called Cubic, which is in Tulsa. It's a creative agency, so we do a lot of destination marketing, so I haven't used, I have my first production WebGL site coming online, which is exciting for me. I hope to have more. Um, so I think it's, it's a technology that's coming on board, and if you don't know what it is, that's okay, I'll explain um, kind of what WebGL is and what it does. Um, next, uh, if you've heard of it, it's uh, 3JS, is an open source project for WebGL, and uh, it's a nice package. It does handle a lot of abstractions for you for working with 3D in the browser. Um, so I've written a decent chunk of that documentation. And for me, I started using 3GS, and it was like, this is super painful. There's no documentation. It says to do everywhere. I have no idea how to do anything. So I just open up source code, start reading, and document it. Because if I didn't document it, I'd forget it. So it's really funny when I go in there and say, oh, let me like read this and figure out what's going on. And it's like, oh. Cool, I wrote that. Like I, like, I don't even remember like, what this does, but I wrote the documentation on it. Um, so that's, that's exciting, and that was really my introduction to open source software. So if you've never done a pull request, if you've never gotten on GitHub to do something, find some documentation that hurts, write something, and submit it. It's awesome, because documentation is one of those things where you can be the expert. You just go read the source code, and then send a pull request in. So if you want like, some place to get started with open source, I would highly recommend that. Um, and finally, um, over the summer, I've, uh, I did a fellowship with Mozilla on WebGL. And so that involved um, writing documentation again through the um, MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network. So I did some content kits for like giving talks, and I've been turning those into actual articles on WebGL. So if you want to get into some of the math and like low-level wonderfully painful stuff. Um, that's kind of what I was dealing with. So there's not as many abstractions there. <clears throat> this is the slide where I explain WebGL, what it is. Okay, name, WebGL, Web Graphics Library. Okay, it's graphics on the web. Spec, so it's based off of OpenGL. Okay, you might have heard of it. Um, it's gonna be in your mobile devices, on your computers. It's an open spec for dealing with graphics. Um, and I'll go into some more detail on what that really looks like. Um, but it's specifically off of the OpenGL ES 2.0 spec. Okay, ES stands for Embedded Systems. Uh, so it's basically like a subset of a subset, which is awesome, great. So we, have like, we don't have a lot to work with. Um, but, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and how it runs. I might actually go a little bit further in that detail a little bit later. So, WebGL sucks, right? That's the, t that's the point of my talk, right? About how much it sucks. Um, no, really, like, it really does suck. Like, don't, like, I'm, I'm being serious. Uh, if you go, if you want, like, to get a book on, like, doing graphics and, like, all this stuff, it's not going to be written in WebGL. Like, there's not books, if they, they're out there, they're gonna be not as good as other books. Um, I'm sure they're coming online eventually, but right now, if you wanna learn it, um, that's, I mean, again, that's why I went in there and wrote documentation, because it, dis, it just hasn't existed. But, you know, that's changing. It's getting more and more mature. 
uh, it doesn't do a lot compared to like things like DirectX. Uh, you could do some really crazy, crazy stuff with kind of the um, top of the line um, software, like with DirectX and like all this crazy stuff that does amazing graphics. You don't get that. Forget about it. You're not going to have it in the browser. But that, that's okay. I'll get into why. Um, and again, it's OpenGL embedded systems, like further restricted down so that you can run it in the browser. Okay, that, that hurts. That's painful. Um, and finally, yes, it runs in the browser. You're using your browser to run like 3D engines and games and things like that. That's crazy. That's like, that sucks. Like that's, you're losing all this like stuff that you get that's amazing that you can do in kind of native code. But forget about all that. Who cares? It's the open web. It's the web. This is a big deal. If you think about it, you have all this like complicated rendering stuff that's you have to like buy a console or like a huge like gaming computer to do all this stuff. But you just type something in your browser, go there, and you can have this amazing 3D experience right from your browser on any device. It doesn't matter. You just load it up and go. For me, like the reason why I've invested my time on it in, in this space is this, is this is a big deal. This is different. This is fundamentally different than what all that other cool stuff can do. I'm not going to play Grand Theft Auto like with all the kind of amazing graphics and everything, like AAA game, just on my browser. It's not necessarily the best use case for it. It might get there eventually. I don't know. But for right now, like it's, it's solving different, different problems. And it's in an exciting way. So I'm excited about it. So if you read my talk description, I'm pretty sure I said I'd explain things at the low level. So um, this talk isn't long enough to do like really crazy amounts of low level stuff. So I want to uh, kind of give you some general conceptual guidelines on what WebGL is and what exactly it does. Because yeah, you can say graphics, but what does that mean? So here's the ba I kind of try to boil it down to the basic steps. You have a state machine that you can config configure. Um, and these are all like your GL calls. Um, and then you take vert vert vertices, points, and you move them. And then you create fragments of color. And then you put them together into a picture. That's what WebGL does. So why is, why is, that, why is that interesting? So um, state machine. You've got triangles, you've got points in space, so you can upload the data. So basically, you're just shooting it up to the graphics card, um, and you're doing this in JavaScript. So this is all JavaScript code right here. Uh, you're configuring what that's going to do. So you're going to say, oh, this is going to like clear this thing, and it's going to like render like this. If I do put these two things on, I want it to behave like this. I want to use like this type of color information. So it's really just like, okay, let's take this thing and reorganize how it looks. And these calls, if you've not dealt with like GL calls, if you're doing it from scratch, it's super painful, super painful. Um, and then finally, you're just telling it to draw. So I've set this whole thing up, now do your thing. So if you think about how JavaScript works, it's basically an event stack. So you, you like a request animation frame comes in. So you're going to start drawing a frame. And then your JavaScript starts executing all its functions like the typical call stack. Well, you're just basically shooting off these things to happen on the GL side. So it kind of shoots it all off to go. And um, then your call stack goes through everything and then stops executing. And you don't have the picture yet. At this point, the graphics card is actually start rendering everything. And it's going to render everything and do everything and then come back with your frame. And then you're going to start another like, request animation frame and deal with it. This is a really a one-way process. So JavaScript, you can write all the, your application state. But the moment you send it to the GPU, to the graphics card, it's a one-way street. So it just goes there. And uh, if you want to get any information back, it's super expensive, especially in the context of the web with the additional security restrictions. So it's kind of a one-way street. So you're just kind of sending it out to do it. And ultimately, what you're getting back, you know, you're in the browser, but you're getting back an image. So it's just like an image in a canvas that sits inside your normal web page. OK, so let's take a, a break from me just talking. And I need like 
um, four people up here. So volunteers, Brian, hey, come on up. Just like a few people, come on up. You're going to be my vertices. <laughs> so okay, yeah, that's that'll be awesome. Okay, so come over here close to me, and so now I'm JavaScript, and I'm saying you guys are my vertices. Go up to the GPU, so you're up there now, and I've told you to do that. And now my shader, a vertex shader, is going to take my vertices right here, and if you see on the slide, it says XYZ to XYZ, okay? If you know WebGL, I'm simplifying things here. I'm not including the fourth dimension. You're welcome. Um, so now I'm the shader program, and I'm gonna say, you know, here's the shader program to each of you. Now I want you all to move up this way, and each of them have just executed the program. So it's parallel. So each of them have some code, and they move. OK, now I want you all to form a, um, a square. OK, now I'm going to shove all them onto the next frame. So basically, they're my vertices that I move around and do things with. OK, now go sit down. So that's just one program that gets loaded. And I can do, the thing is, the reason why it's fast is I get to get the entire room in here. And I just set them all up, and then each of you move, it moves independently based on the program. So that's parallel code. This is why it's fast. This is why you can have millions of vertices and move them all at once, because the graphics card can do that in parallel. OK. So next is the fragment shader. So no one has to get up for this one. But the way it works is it basically goes through each pixel and generates a color fragment. So you're taking XYZ data, or there's other information there. I'm just trying to simplify the process. And you're taking that positioned information and generating a color off of it, or a whole bunch of colors. So if this is an image array, um, each person is going to go through, and you're going to be red. So raise your hand. Red, green, blue, red, teal, cyan. You know, like basically, and that's all going to go massively parallel. So it's, it's rasterizing is the process. And it's going to generate color fragments. So with that, and I'll explain what a fragment is, how a fragment's sort of a pixel, but it's not quite a pixel yet. Oh, I don't have, oh, there it is. I skipped one. So this is the composition step. You have this like RG, you have a color and um, a depth associated with it, and basically it just takes your multiple fragments. So if you have a triangle and it, you have another triangle over it, how do you sort out which one gets on the screen? Um, it's this step. It's the composition step. So this step basically generates the pixel that gets shown at the end of it. Okay. <sighs> this is super fun code to write. It's awesome. GL clear color, GL enable, GL depth test, GL clear. You know, here, color buffer bit or depth buffer bit. Like, you know, you're messing with bits right there to like configure settings on it. This is great. I love writing code like this. This is so like beautiful. No. So th this, this, is what, this is what an API, like a low level graphics API exposes. That's, you know, that's, if you're writing a game engine, this is great. This is awesome. This is what you want. You're going to write something amazing that's going to take your problem and solve it this way and it's abstract it so that someone hopefully doesn't have to think about it very much. But the more you get into it and the more you want to like do amazing things with it, the more you have to dive into this level. Um, I've written like boxes that spin in 3D space from scratch doing this and it's an amazing exercise. I will not write production code like that um, because it is too painful. So that's where you get frameworks. And so I'm just using 3JS because that's where I have the most comfort level and has the most market penetration what's going on. So you can see the, like, the code for generating, in, like this code right here, that's not everything. That's just as much as I could fit on a screen for like a draw call. There's still a lot of setup that goes there. This code is a lot more manageable. It's, doing, it's, it's very opinionated, and it's doing a lot of things for you, but it enables you to do interesting things. So if you see, like, you're creating a scene, a camera, and a renderer, 
creating a cube, which is a mesh, which is a combination of geometry and like a material, moving the camera around, adding the cube, and rendering it. I mean, this is, this is kind of like the typical example. Um, like if you're gonna draw an owl, like from the previous talk, you're gonna add like a few spheres. Like it's not gonna get you where you wanna go if you wanna do something amazing, but it's solving a lot of the difficult problems for you. So, you know, the role of frameworks is ease of use, opinion, and tools. You want tools, you want these abstractions built on a low-level framework. But those tools can get in the way. Those opinions can get in the way. Get in the, way. the ease of use has a cost at some point. Um, so I don't recommend building your own framework unless you're super passionate about it. I don't recommend doing it from scratch unless you're doing it as a learning exercise, which I do recommend. Um, but just realize the limitations and things and the struggles you're gonna come, come across with that. So let's talk about native frameworks. Um, I'm just gonna put a smattering in there. Of like 3JS is like the most complete, Pixie.js is the most complete, 2D one, um, in my opinion. Um, and they have the most mind share, which I think is huge. Even if you don't agree with the architecture or style completely, they, uh, you can get a lot of stuff done with it. Uh, StackGL is another one I've contributed to like this much. Um, which is a loose set of modules. It's basically WebGL on, on um, NPM. It's just a set of modules that do useful things. I love it. The devs there, like a lot of them are super smart, doing interesting things that I don't have to figure out and I can just use, so that's great. Um, Mapbox.gl.js, you know, taking mapping. I don't know as much about it, but I definitely want to throw it in there because I know that's a more practical application. Um, if you're into gaming, like this is, this is cool. So like Phaser, Phaser is pretty, pretty neat. Um, you can do lots of like tiled map type stuff and um, create a game pretty quickly and it's built on top of, top of Pixie. So people are building abstract, abstractions on top of abstractions. Uh, Goo Engine, Play Canvas, I haven't used these personally but um, they're kind of definitely at the top of the Google results. So include those in there. And, and one other thing to keep in mind, this is a low level API, right? So, people are compiling to, to it as a target. So this is taking existing tool sets and letting you just you know, say, oh, set WebGL true and then export, which is cool because it lets you do a lot of interesting stuff. There's costs associated with that because you've taken a pipeline and, and philosophy that's not web oriented and just throwing it on the web. So I like, if you're looking at like doing a simple hello world, you're already looking at like 50 megabytes worth of code you're gonna have to download just to even get started. Um, so I don't think this is the end game. I think this is a nice intermediate step to say, hey, look at this cool thing I did. I think it's great for um, sharing, um, what's the um, game, Love Me Dare, is that it? Yeah, what? Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Anyway, like the game competitions where you're like doing a, a game in a weekend or a week. This is a great thing because you can so easily share this out with everyone. Um, again, not, I don't think it's the end game. I think it'll, it'll get us closer to it though. Okay, so I've talked a lot about like what these technologies can do. Let me just show off um, some of the things. So, What's kind of interesting is, is you think, a lot of times you think WebGL, and you think, okay, I'm gonna create 3D content, but this is an app that lets you just color and everything else. And if you think about this, I mean, there's, there's, four, there's essentially four points here, you know, in the corners of the picture, so that vertex shader is not gonna be doing much, but the fragment shader can operate on everything super efficiently in the browser, so you can do image processing right from the browser so it enables all kinds of different interesting apps that way. Um, data visualization. This is not quick. There we go. This is, um, I think this is LiDAR data, point data. So it's positional data with color as well. And it's using GL point rendering. So it's just rendering a square and putting a color on it. But you can see as it's loading in, it's, do, it's doing things that the web is good at. The web is good at taking data and throwing it out there for the end user to use. And you see that that's what's going on here. They're just kind of, you can see the resolution kind of come in as you zoom in 
and more points show, and there's a loading bar as you load the data. This is stuff the web is really great at. And all you need to do is throw a browser at it. Um, and this is like important, you know, it can be for industry applications or even just like checking something out. For instance, like here's the, here's the Sagrada Familia. I mean, that's, that's pretty neat, that's pretty nifty. Because you can zoom in and you know, see all different details. And it's, you know, the thing is fully lit because the data you have is lit. So you can see shadows and everything else. Um, and this is just like a fire hose of data <laughs> that's going into your browser, filling up like all your memory buffers and just like sh shoving it through this pipeline to render it all. Um, your computer might get a little hot running it. Uh, WebGL is great to work on on cold nights. Have a warm <laughs> cup of coffee. Hot laptop burning my legs. If you think in terms of, of the, and this is what I'm really excited about, and I think there's, there might be, less, um, might be less money in this, but I'm really excited about it and what it enables it, and the fact that for education, the educational impact of something like WebGL and being able to explain things in the browser and all you have to do is just load it up and go there and be able to interact with the entire human body and explain different parts and check it. And you're just loading up a browser to like some website and going in. And the amount of impact that, that a technology like this has, I think is, is super exciting. I, I went on to, I don't have an example of it, but I, I went on to a blog that was explaining math concepts, um, ACO.net. And it just was WebGL like embedded you know, like little visualizations showing these amazing like transformations in the math and just made it so much easier to understand. Um, mapping. So here's Mapbox. So it's butter smooth. If you're serving tiles up in the DOM, like it's it, it's slow. So, but this makes it fast, and you can you know easily have these smooth transitions, throw large data sets at it, and 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 deal with it. Um, I'm not into mapping um, that much. I'd love to at some point dive into it, um, but it is like a clear use case um, for it. And actually, I was. Super excited. I didn't know about it. And apparently it's been there for a long time. So um, if you knew about this, I didn't. I don't know how I didn't. So you know, like this is all powered by WebGL, Google Maps. But what's crazy about it is that like they have this like, okay, let's like look at the city. So I want to go visit somewhere. I'm gonna go like zoom around and like get like really detailed, like have the trees, the cars, and everything in there. <laughs> Like I zoomed in, like, oh, there's my car, and it's a little bump, that's, that's cool. And it loads in dynamically. Like, again, this is what the web's good for. I'm just loading data on the fly through there, zooming around, looking at it. Huge data sets that I have at the tip of my fingers by just loading my browser there. I think that's, like, that's hugely exciting. And I know people out in the crowd probably have access to large data sets that can be visualized for your industry, for, for um, whatever applications. And anytime I go travel now, um, I mean, that it just zooming in on Paris to the Eiffel Tower. I mean, they, that's like sci-fi stuff. You know, when I was a kid, it's like, oh my gosh, I mean, that's pretty exciting. Um, marketing. I mean, yes, yay, marketing. Like, you might not realize that this is just a web page. But it's like super simplistic, like, okay, these little iPhones are actually like 3D models. And you might not know it because it's the web and you can just integrate it into a website. Uh, realism. I haven't focused that much on the realism aspect because people are gonna do it better in other situations. And this project's called Uncanny Valley because it, people in 3D are creepy and that's kind of the point of this one. But you know, it's really realistic and it's just rendered in the browser, and your lap gets really hot because it's running JavaScript. And science applications. Just being able to visualize, you know, I think the, if I were in school trying to learn this stuff, and I could easily start to play with molecules on the fly and, and adapt them for my own uses, I don't know of a clear 
like really tangible thing that's been built other than like loading up some samples. But there, this seems like low-hanging fruit to me. Like if you want to make an impact in, in people's lives, this seems like the type of thing that if, you're, if you have some expertise in it and can bridge the gap between the graphics knowledge and like science knowledge, I think the ability to educate is, is huge. I mean, here's a protein that you can just load up and look at it and check it out. I mean, I think that's, that's exciting stuff. And, and one other thing that, I, that you, I'm seeing more and more with like New York Times and other um, newspapers is the storytelling aspect. Um, this is just one example of using some text to do it. But you can like really just create an article. And you know, this is just like an article with stuff and embed content that like is interactive on top of it. And I think that's another exciting thing. Does anyone know when I should end since we're running late? OK, well, I'll just keep on rambling for another 10 minutes. How about that? Um, so OK, I've explained like, some of the pain points, some things that like, make things get hot whenever you're like, using a computer. That's not going to go away, probably. It's still going to be a little bit resource intensive. Um, but one thing that's exciting is, is um, some just, I'm going to go into some, some just like technical technology that's coming on board right now. Uh, GLTF, file format. Um, is a file format for the web. That's exciting. So right now, Collada is a, like, a pretty standard one, but it's XML. It's big. It's verbose, large file sizes. This is JSON. Um, so you can use your traditional pipelines to pull in all your content. So a lot of the work on 3D graphics is like putting this stuff together, and like you need robust tool sets. So this is starting to bridge that gap from existing tool chains. So you can use Blender, 3D Studio Max, Maya, Cinema 4, whatever you're comfortable with, and bring that content into the web. Slowly, people are like, OK, we're running WebGL. No one's computer's catching fire. Just your pants, because it's hot. Um, but it's becoming less of a subset. So this is a good thing. If you remember why WebGL sucked, it's because there's lots of pain points. So those, some of those people are saying, OK, let's overcome these pain points with WebGL, with WebGL 2.0. Um, so they're introducing instancing. So that means I can have one thing of geometry and then render it multiple times on the, on the screen. So if I have um, 100 spaceships, it's not 100 draw calls, it's one draw call. And it's just repeated throughout. So that's a big deal, because it, it means you can have more things flying across the screen. Yes, I love doing that. I love adding zeros to the end of things, see how many I can get on there. Uh, deferred rendering, like what, what, what's that? Who knows? Who knows what that is? Um, so again, Grand Theft Auto example. Uh, deferred rendering is basically sharing this pipeline of, of graphics and creating different data and combining it back together. So the rendering is deferred, like you're just creating intermediate steps. And then eventually, it'll, uh, I can't go to the next one. Combine together like some depth, stencil information into like the final rendered graphic. And this needs to happen typically at 60 frames per second. So you get these like, amazingly rendered scenes um, really fast. And um, it's really cool stuff. So that's coming on board. So you're going to see more and more um, alignment with uh, traditional um, like AAA gaming type of graphics. Um, not everything. There's still like, a lot of stuff in DirectX is like, crazy. They're not, it's not even in OpenGL. Um, WebVR, put on a headset. You go and basically there's like um, navigator.getvr devices. Load up a device and hook into it. I mean, and you're just on the you're just on a website, you know, very sci-fi. That's exciting stuff. Um, I haven't experienced it personally myself. I'm looking forward to eventually buying one and then like playing around with all this stuff. But if you're looking at the future, what's coming on board? This this is one of those things. So, uh, where to learn? This is getting better. It still kind of is a little bit painful. 3JS.org, if you want to get into 3, 3JS, there's some docs. Um, they still need a lot of improvement, even though I've been working on it. <laughs> um, MDN, um, Mozilla Developer Network, I've written some articles for there. There's some existing ones. It's not as good for the spec, because they don't have all that documented out. Um, I recommend the MSDN. That has the most complete um, spec. If you're interested in like low-level stuff, that's really good. Um, reading. The spec sucks, but is the best way. 
best way to kind of learn that side of it. Um, and it's hard to read because you have, it's like referencing, here's WebGL, and it's using this spec as well. So you click on it, and it's, you have to cross-reference stuff. So it's a little bit painful. And if you're interested in, there's lots of math that goes into this stuff. So mathematics for 3D game programming and computer graphics, I recommend that book um, because it makes the math simple to understand as, as much as you can. Um, I'm going to ramble for seven more minutes since we're running late. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of my exploration of, of this space. Um, so when I started doing all this, uh, I started fairly simple and um, doing like a gravity simulation. But what's cool is you can have lots of things on the screen. So this is just shooting arrows like crazy out and creating a simulation as it goes through. And I can just like play around with it and you know, it makes some cool patterns as you go through. Um, and then you know, iterate on it a little bit. Now, this is the browser, usually it's like super slow, but I could like start throwing these things in. Um, and this is using Pixie JS to do it. Um, so you can see like, if you're starting small, like this is not that complicated of code to write. It really isn't. You have an update loop and moving it, and then uh, playing around with how it goes. So this is like they're self-attracted now to it. So you can like start creating cool, fun things. Um, you can take existing data. So this is a NASA image that I projected onto a globe, and so this is um, CO2 levels on the Earth. So I took something that like was pre-existing did a visualization off of it, threw the NASA logo on it so I felt cool, <laughs> and then shared it, and it's like, okay, that's, that's fun. And this thing is that like, they just released the map, which was cool in and of itself, but I thought like, the projection was weird and distorted the amount of CO2 levels, so I wanted to understand that a little bit further. But there's lots of open data out there to visualize. London, or England just released like 10, 20,000, I don't know, like terabytes of data, of LiDAR data, positional data for England. Like that's if you want to visualize that, that'd be awesome. Uh, gaming. Um, so, you know, this is like a space shooter. It's a little dark, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you can't really see it. Uh, but I'm mainly using GL lines to like draw a line, like a typical space shooter. Um, you can see a little bit of asteroids, a little bit better there. Uh, so you can start playing around with gaming. And this, this is like uses browser history. So I can switch levels by hitting the back button. Like, I think that's kind of cool. I can share out just a single level and it'll take you directly to the level. Um, like if you think in terms of the browser, and I think that's where kind of the impact of it is, is thinking in terms of what makes the browser different? What makes the, the web different than traditional gaming? Like this is not on Steam, but I can create like a small level and share it out with people and get instant feedback. I don't have to like go through anything else. Like maybe the revenue model isn't there, um, but for just like fun stuff like that, I think that's really cool. And I'm sure the revenue, people love making money, so people figure out the revenue model. Uh, this is me playing around with, um, this is Phaser, using the tiles to like, do like, animations and running around. Uh, I've recreated this thing like five times in like five different languages. So <laughs> Each time I create like two more tile sets, so I like, have a little bit more to play with, and then I'm like, okay, that's enough work. Uh, That one's a little hard to see. Loading up some ones and zeros to grow. Oh, it's not playing, that's why. Yeah, it's a little dark, but doing like dynamic um, procedural generation uh, for different uh, things. Like for me, like the code is what's kind of fun. So being able to experiment, share that out, um, and what's fun is when things go viral, like this went viral on Reddit, and so like my GoDaddy hosting, which like normally it's like, oh God, GoDaddy was fine, because like it's got tons of traffic. It's super exciting, just like, okay, I had this kind of fun idea and visualization, and uh, played around with it, and so. The, I, think, I think, I mean really, the, the real power is the open web. It's shareable. There's you know, storytelling, education aspects of it industry applications, um, and I, I think that for me is what's really exciting about taking these low-level graphic APIs 
and exposing them to the web because it puts it out there for anyone to kind of easily access and you can load it up and like load it up on your phone and show someone and it's, you know if you do the typical responsive design stuff it's it still works um, and I think that level of universal access is really exciting I think we're still getting there we're still getting there for what what we can access um, but eventually, I think there'll be some really killer applications, and you won't even know what's running it un underneath the hood, um, and you shouldn't, but it does enable those type of experiences. So yeah, I tweet a lot about WebGL and like JavaScript stuff <coughs> at that. Um, so if you want to follow my explorations and interaction, you ask questions. Um, I love that level of interaction, so feel free to chat at me. So yeah, any, any questions before we stop? Um, do 2D, because that makes, if you haven't done real time, do 2D because it makes this problems a lot easier to solve. Um, and either get Pixie or Phaser. Phaser has some great, Phaser has a lot, of, lot more abstraction over the underlying technologies, but it has lots of great examples. Um, Pixie has some good examples. It's, it's a little bit more low level. It's more like Flash in that. Um, if you want to get into 3D, um, there's a lot of math. Beef up and like read a math book um, while you're playing with it because, I mean, you're just not going to get away from it. Um, which can be a good thing. Like, I, I don't have a math background, but I have learned a lot of math doing all this stuff. Anyone else? At least one more. Come on, one more question. Oh, I would offer up um, Mr. Dew has published a really cool site you can go to where you can start doing VJ and S coding in the browser. So if you're wanting to get into it, that's a really fun easy way to start learning yeah, and that's like 3js.org um, slash editor, I think is the URL for that one. I was trying to look up the URL. I can't this, Yeah, that, I haven't had as much success with that one. Like, I go in there, like, I don't know. Of course, I already know the underlying stuff. Um, so that is probably just a little bit more work. So you mentioned that um, OpenGL ES isn't as powerful as a full uh, OpenGL or DirectX or anything. Is there like an analogy of just like PlayStation 1 level graphics? I, I would use the, the, the phrase, a, a poor craftsman blames his tools, um, because it's, not, it's, it's less tools there. You can still create amazing things with it. Um, some of the, like I think the deferred rendering is going to be the biggest one. Another one is creating geometry on the fly. So between, you saw that pipeline I mentioned earlier, it's missing some additional steps of like creating geometry on the fly that can um, subdivide. Um, and so that is, that's missing. But, for realism, I think the in-depth amount of stuff you can throw at the screen is less, but the amount of like cool graphics you can still create with it is is you can still do a lot. Oh, okay. Uh, so the subdivisional stuff is not included in the shader steps. I'm not sure you'd have to do it beforehand. So you'd have to actually generate the geometry to upload it into the buffers. There's, there's things like normal, normal mapping, which can actually like move geometry around based on an image. That is possible, um, which can get a lot of that type of effect. But um, that's more of the, on the modeling side than like real-time interactive graphics. Uh, vector math, lots of vectors, lots of matrices. Um, if you want, uh, there's, I wrote, that's actually what most of my MDN articles I wrote were focusing on. We're trying to explain that math on the, uh, in the context of WebGL for JavaScript programmers. So I'd highly recommend checking that out if you want the math, if you want some practical examples of math. I still have one more like lighting tutorial I need to finish um, writing, writing out. But. Cool, I don't want to take, oh, go ahead, one more. Uh, so you'll see companies like uh, 
real agent is supported by the agency of the office. That's the agency of the community supported by the agency of the office. All right, well, thank you all so much. I don't want to take any more of your time so the other speakers have a chance. But thanks for talking.